Let's begin with prayer. Merciful and gracious God, we ask for your guidance this morning as we hear your word in scripture and look for ways to turn our lives around and follow you. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and our redeemer. Amen. I remember just a glimmer back when I was in kindergarten of a little girl named Megan. It is an anguished memory because it was a girl I simply could not bear. I did not like her at all, and I cannot remember why, except for one minor incident, a faded memory of her being terribly angry one day. We were just in from the playground on a cold, late autumn day, struggling out of our coats at the cubby, her kicking off her big yellow rubber rain boots and giving me a look with curled, furled eyebrows and burning me with unkind words over in my direction. I don't remember what she said, only that I didn't like it, and I kept my distance from her after that. Weeks later, in midwinter, I noticed that she'd stopped coming to school. I remember being glad. Good riddance, I thought, and then I didn't think much about her again until late that spring. One morning our teachers gathered us in and sat us down in a tight little circle on the classroom rug where we usually met to hear a story be read. But this time the kindergarten teacher spoke to us with a very serious face and with quiet words. She explained to us that our classmate Megan had died in the hospital over the weekend. It turns out her long absence had been due to a long illness. Perhaps the adults knew what it was. But as far as I knew, it was my fault. Megan had died because I didn't like her. And worse. I had wished her ill. I slowly slid back out of the circle and kept my head down. I had done a really bad thing. I wouldn't look up and I wouldn't speak anymore that day. I remember because the teachers thought I was sick, so they called my mother and had her come pick me up early from school. It was half day, morning kindergarten, and she would have known that there hadn't been a single thing wrong with me when she dropped me off, maybe a half hour before. It was also the last day of school, and I had been looking forward to receiving the prize of perfect attendance at the end of the year ceremony, a handshake with the headmaster. But I missed the ceremony entirely. And when I got home, I threw up. It's hard to fathom times when bad things befall innocent victims. When tornadoes strip every leaf off one tree and leave the one next to it untouched. Destroy one home, but not the neighbors. Flatten one neighborhood, but jump 50 miles to the next. Why one vibrant, kind-hearted man is struck down by a heart attack while a hurtful, irresponsible person lives a long but abusive life. It makes no sense. How can it be that an Iraq war veteran just home from the fighting is killed by a drunk driver on Main Street in his hometown once back in the States? Why this one and not that? Why him and not her? Why her and not me? We don't like random. We don't understand it. 
We can make ourselves feel a little better about a pack-a-day smoker who is diagnosed with emphysema. But when a friend who works out at the Y every day and who never smoked a cigarette in her life is diagnosed with lung cancer, we scratch our heads and walk away wondering, how can this be? There is no logic, no cause and effect, no justice. It makes no sense. Where is the justice? Where is God? And this is exactly what the followers of Jesus were asking. How could God allow Pilate to execute their friends, the Galileans? Had they been sinners? Was God punishing them? And Jesus tells them flat out, no. God does not work vengeance. God does not punish our sins with calamity. Ours is a loving God, a God of second chances, a God of new beginnings, a God who provides us with choices and freedom to act of our own volition. Some will act in obedience to God, Others will do harm. Forces of nature will erupt. The wind will blow as it may. The tower of Siloam may fall. But the people crushed by it were no worse people than anyone else. For we all have dirty hands. We all fall short of the mark that God has set for us. And God knows that. That's why God sent us Jesus to help get us back on track, to help us practice kindness and show mercy and do justice. And that's why Jesus calls us to turn ourselves around and begin new lives with Christ's mission of caring for each other, of serving the common good at Life Center. We hear Jesus call on the people to repent in our sermon text this morning, but the translation is a poor one. For the Greek word used here by Jesus, the action he urges of all of us, is metanoia. Our new revised standard version of the Bible translates this word as repent, but the word means to turn around to change our mindset, change our actions and our inner being to a completely different way of living. Instead of acting selfishly all the time as we are programmed to do, hardwired as humans to look out for ourselves first, we are called to become other-centered, Christ-centered even, to begin the eternal life that starts today an eternal life of joyful living in God's presence, the joy upon joy and grace upon grace that we receive through the power of positive, kind-hearted living. God doesn't bring illness, death, and destruction upon any of us. Instead, God is there at our side to comfort us when destruction happens nor are we to blame ourselves for the inexplicable. There is randomness in our world, and it is troubling to our logical minds. But just as random are the acts of mercy, the miracles of healing, and the breathtaking beauty of God's grace, when we forgive one another, when we comfort the lonely, the grieving, the hurting, who can explain unmerited kindness? But how could we ever live without it? Unexpected death and destruction makes no sense, but neither does the fresh start in life that the power of the Spirit can bring. Instead of lamenting, we are called to love's labor, to live a new life of nurture by the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was startling for me to see, a year later, when I had graduated into the first grade, 
that the little girl named Megan had actual parents. I had not been capable of imagining anyone else in the brief life of this tragic but ornery little girl. I realize now that she was probably ill-tempered because she was already suffering, already in pain from her slowly encroaching illness, whatever it was, when I brushed into that rip saw of her rough side on that long ago day. But a few months later, my first grade class, which would have been Megan's first grade class too, was invited back up to the kindergarten grounds of the green lawn hillside campus of my northern Connecticut grade school. There we were gathered into a circle once again, but this time we remained standing and stood outside around a garden space just beside the front of the low, long, glass-windowed building that housed both, both the nursery school and the kindergarten classrooms. That's when I saw a nice-looking couple, a mom in her dress with short brown hair and a pixie cut and a quiet strength that I could almost feel. She spoke something close into the ear of her husband and then again as she turned with nervous energy to the teachers and finally what she had been avoiding looked out kindly at the group of us, our class minus Megan as we circled around them. But it was her husband who saw me and paused. He had horn-rimmed glasses and curly brown hair and wore a suit and tie. He looked like everyone else's dad I knew wearing office clothes, except when he saw me, he smiled. And I smiled back. But then I got shy and I looked away. I wasn't sure who they were. That's when our old kindergarten teacher introduced the couple as Megan's parents. And we all stared at them like the survivors of the terrible tragedy that they were. We did not speak. They tried to smile at us, but we were busy remembering Megan and that she was not with us anymore. The kindergarten teacher began to talk to us again to explain things. I saw that the headmaster was there too, and other adults. I started to look around and realized that something important was happening. That's when I noticed that Megan's parents were standing beside a small tree with just a few branches, its trunk all wrapped in burlap like a bandage to some horrible wound. The tree, someone was explaining, would be planted right there in the hole that I saw dug in the ground next to the school building. It would be planted there in memory of Megan. And as we grew older and taller and stronger, the teacher continued. So with the tree. And we could remember her this way. It was her parents' gift to the school and to us. We would call it Megan's tree. So they planted the tree, the mom and the dad together, half lifting it, half dragging it into the ground. The dad got down on one knee and pushed the soil all around it with his bare hands. Carefully and tenderly, he patted it down all around the slender trunk of Megan's tree. And when he stood up, I saw that the knee of his trousers was wet and soiled from the dirt. I wondered if he could feel the dampness, but he didn't seem to care. Then the mom took a watering can and poured water around the base of the tree slowly like so many tears until it was empty. 
Afterwards, we walked back down the hill in silence because none of us knew what to say. When you hear the parable of the fig tree and the message that Jesus brings for us to turn our lives around, you might notice that it's a story about second chances. It's a story about a gardener who takes mercy upon a little tree, a three-year-old tree that another man said should be cut down because she had not yet borne any fruit, not yet blossomed, never yet flourished. But sometimes it's worth another try with someone close by who cares, someone who doesn't mind kneeling in the earth and sprinkling the compost around it like the sprinkled blood of Jesus, like the nourishing kindness of love's labor, like the gardener was willing to do like Jesus does for us. And if this is the case, that Jesus is willing to bend down and get dirty and break a sweat for each and every one of us, then why shouldn't we make an effort ourselves to turn our lives around and do our best to start again and live a new life, an eternal life, in the grace that God offers us each and every single day. Ten years ago, on a whim, when I returned to America with my own family after living abroad for a decade, when my girls had graduated from kindergarten and moved on to first grade and beyond, I went to visit my old school and I brought my husband and my two daughters with us. It is a beautiful campus set on the hill that we optimistically call a mountain. The school grounds traverse the hillside and playing fields terrace the school buildings above and below it. The topmost building belongs to the smallest children, the nursery school and kindergarten. We parked our car at the entrance of the grounds and walked up the flagstoned walk and under the covered walkway that led to the kindergarten. I remember every inch of it until I arrived at the front of the building. I was looking for Megan's tree, but when we arrived at the place where her tree was planted, there was no longer just one tree. There was tree after tree after tree, and they were tall and strong and in full blossom, white petaled pear trees, magnolia and apple. The hillside was so beautiful it took our breath away. Megan's parents must have planted a new tree every year. I found Megan's tree, tall and strong, and all her sister trees, all flowering, white, innocent, flourishing, sunlit and bright. New life, new hope, new health. I said a prayer there for Megan, there in her kindergarten garden well-tended, loved, and nurtured by the gardener who loves us all, whose voice I could almost hear saying the words I was seeking all those years ago. <coughs> it's nothing you did. It's nothing she did. So turn your life around and be at peace. And as I turned around, to find my daughters already walking up the next hill. They called back to me and said, Come on, Mom. Let's find where this path leads.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.